Hi everyone, welcome to my video. Today we're going to solve CFE Day 3 tax topics, specifically personal taxes payable and corporate taxes payable. Please note that these are going to be from actual CFE questions, but I've tried to block out the names of the company to not reveal too much about the cases. So now let's look at a personal income tax payable example. I've taken only the various parts of the case that relates to this question. For example, there was a note disclosure on how much wages were, which was 50000 and then there's another paragraph in the case that said, Wages are my salary for the year, including $2,426 from the Canadian pension plan paid by ABC. Assume that's the company name. An equal amount was withheld from my pay from the employee portion. Federal income taxes withheld from my pay were $3,600. And then in the case, they also talk about various other facts. So it says, Information for the 2019 personal taxes. In addition to my income from ABC Inc., I received $5,000 eligible dividends and $6,000 in interest income. I paid a $500 fee for investment broker ad advice. My husband earned $10,000 in employment income in 2019. I have a $1,000 receipt for child care in 2019. I have a $1,500 donation slip from a local registered charity. I contributed $500 per month to my RRSP throughout 2019, but began in January 2020. I increased it to $600 a month. According to my 2018 Notice of Assessment, I had $10,000 of RRSP deduction room available for 2019. In the past, I have always deducted the maximum RRSP amount on my tax returns. So now let's try to solve for the personal income tax payable. But actually, before we can do that, we have to solve for the personal tax credits. And to do that, we start with the basic personal amount, which is $12,069. And remember, all these rates are based on the year of the case, so they might differ from yours a little bit. Next, we try to figure out the spousal amount, which is essentially the basic personal amount minus the income of the spouse and then minus any childcare expense, which in this case was $12,069 minus 10,000 minus 1,000, which gives you $3,069. The next, we have to figure out how much we paid into CPP, which is 2,426. And then you have to add in the employment amount, which in this year was 1,222. Again, the basic personal amount, the spousal amount, and the employment amounts are all in your reference sheet given to you at the exam. So you don't actually need to memorize these amounts, you just need to know where to put them. So all of those summed up, you get to take a 15% tax credit. So you multiply that by 15%. And then now let's deal with the donations. So D, so how donations work? For the first $200 that you donate, you get 15% back. And then on the remaining, you get 29%. So since we donated $1,500, the first $200 gets us $30 of tax credits, and the remaining gets us $377, which adds up to $407 of tax credits. And then lastly, we have to figure out what is our federal dividends tax credit, which is E. So 6 11th of what we calculated as our gross up becomes our dividend tax credit. And how to get our gross up amount is essentially you multiply the eligible dividends received, which is $5,000 times 38%. And that's how you get your $1,900, which in turn you will multiply by 6 11th to get $1,036. Something to note here is that you're only getting a credit on the gross up amount, which is 38% of your 5,000, which becomes 1,900. And you're not taking it on the full grossed up dividends, which is a larger amount where we will be calculating in the next slide. And in total, when you sum up all those different things that you calculated, you end up with a personal tax credit of $4,261. So now we can finally solve for the personal income tax payable. So to start, we take their employment income, which is 50,000 of wages, and then we subtract the amounts that they paid for a CPP which is $2,426. And then we try to figure out their property income. And the word property here doesn't mean like real estate property. It means income that are from dividends, fixed income, gains, and rental income. So for this person, you could see that they had $5,000 of eligible dividends. 
And then what we have to do is figure out how much do we include in income. And for dividends, we have to gross it up by 38% if they're eligible dividends. If it's non-eligible dividends, which means it is from private companies, there's actually a different gross up rate that you need to know as well. So the total dividends to include an in income is $6,900, which is the $5,000 of actual dividends you got, and then the $1,900, which is the 38% gross up. Next, we would include the interest income, which is $6,000, and then we get to subtract any broker fee, which is $500. So something to remember is that any money that you've made from investing, you can actually subtract any fees that you've incurred to earn that investment income, whether it's for dividends, interest, rental property, or capital gains. So then when we add all that up, we get to the $12,400, which is all the additional property income we need to add to our employment income. And then afterwards, we can deduct our RRSPs. So in F, we see that the person paid $500 for 10 months, and then $600 for another two months. So in total, they can deduct $6,200. Something to note here is that any RRSP contributions in the first two months of the following year, you could actually deduct it from the previous year. Once we deduct the RRSP amounts from our total income, we get 53,774. And then after that is just straight calculation of what is the federal tax on taxable income. So you'll get the different buckets in your reference sheet on the exam, so no need to memorize that. So the first $47,630 would be taxed at the 15% rate, and then the next bucket would be taxed at the 20.5% rate. Since this person doesn't earn more than $95,259, we don't need to worry about the third bucket. And you'll get a total of $8,405 of federal taxes payable. And then we will subtract the credits that we've calculated in the previous slide, which is $4,261. And then you'll get a total amount of federal taxes payable of $4,144. And the last part, don't forget to subtract any taxes withheld, which in this case was $3,600. And in total, your balance payable is $544. So if you thought you're done, not so fast. There's actually more things you should tell your client before they leave. You should end off with some tax advice and planning tips, or else why would they ever pay us for the millions of dollars of service fees? Just kidding. But if you do know anyone that's willing to pay millions of dollars for the following tax tips, let me know, because this person and I need to be best friends. So the tips and reminders we'll give the client are that the personal income tax return deadline is on April 30th, 2020, whatever the year is, plus or minus a date or two, depending on if it lands on a weekend. And then that January and February RRSP contributions are deductible for the previous year, depending on the deduction limit of the previous year. Child care costs must be deducted on the tax return of the lower income spouse, and documents of tax donations should be retained. If there's any opportunity within the case to advise for any income tax splitting or spousal RRSP contribution or ways to minimize tax or invest more effectively through RRSP or TFSA, you should advise your client as well. And perhaps they'll pay you a little bit more for that. But as for me, I work off my passion for accounting, so I don't need that. But your likes and subscribes would be great. So now let's look at a corporate income tax payable example. So in this example, it says, in addition to my employment income, I provide consulting services as a sole proprietor to several clients. During the year, I collected $150,000 in revenue from different consulting engagements, including ABC Inc. This amount excludes $50,000 that I have invoiced another customer on January 3rd, 2021 for consulting services provided in 2020. I expect to receive the funds tomorrow. One client owes me $30,000 from two years ago, but as they went bankrupt during 2020, I doubt I would actually receive it. And then business expenses are as follows. Advertising for $3,000. Business insurance for $2,200. Membership for $1,200. Travel expenses for $22,000. Membership includes dues to professional bodies related to my consulting work, as well as my online video game account of $800 that I use to entertain myself during travel. Travel expenses include hotels for $14,000, flights for $6,000, and meals for $2,000.
My employment and business income are all used to cover my living expenses. Also, please tell me if I had incorporated my business before January 1st, 2020, what the corporate federal income taxes payable for 2020 would be. And you might notice that I removed some sentences in the last paragraph, and that's because I just wanted us to focus on the corporate federal income taxes payable in this scenario. So now let's try to figure out how to calculate the corporate income tax payable. So to do that, we first have to calculate what is the net business income. So number one, we start with the consulting revenue of this company, which is $200,000. And how we determine that is we add up the $150,000 that they have reported, and then we add in the $50,000 that was billed after year end for the work done in the previous year, which was 2020. And this is in line with our accounting standards as well. Then you subtract the business expenses, which is everything you had to pay to help your company make money. So for example, the first one is advertising of $3,000. And then the second one is bad debt expense, which is $30,000. And we got that from assuming that we're going to write off the $30,000 for the client that has not paid in two years and went bankrupt. So this is consistent with accounting standards where if you have a bad debt expense, you could write it off and it will reduce your income. Next, we have the insurance expense of $2,200, and then we have membership fees, which are allowed to be deducted. However, only the membership fees that relate to the actual professional bodies and consulting work that you're providing can be deducted. So sorry, the video game expenses cannot. If it can, my company will probably be in deficit every single year because of video game expenses. And then we'll have the meals, which is deductible, but only up to 50% of it. So since we spent $2,000, only $1,000 can be deducted for income tax purposes. And then in terms of travel, we could deduct the full amount, so the hotel, plus the flights. So $14,000 plus $6,000, and that totals up to $20,000. And in total, our net business income becomes $143,400. So now let's talk about how to actually calculate the Part 1 federal taxes payable for a corporation after we have calculated the net business income. So you start off by multiplying the net business income by the 38% corporate taxable rate. And since the owner resides in British Columbia, their business would be considered a Canadian controlled private corporation or a CCPC if it was incorporated. And therefore it will be eligible for the small business deduction and calculating its taxes payable. And to figure out what is the small business deduction, it has to be the least of the active business multiplied by the small business deduction or the taxable income multiplied by the small business deduction rate or the business limit multiplied by the small business deduction. And as you can see on the screen, the first and second calculation gets the same amount and then the third calculation gets a greater amount. So the least of those three is $27,246 that is eligible to be deducted. In addition, we'll also get a federal tax abatement, which is 10% of our net business income, further reducing the federal taxes payable. In total, we'll have to pay $12,906. Please note that the 38% business income tax rate, the 19% of small business deduction, and the 10% of federal tax abatement is not provided on your exam. So you should really memorize these numbers. In addition, these numbers have probably changed, so you need to know what it is for the year that you're studying for. So now let's look at what are the schedules provided in the exam. And you can find all these at the end of the Board of Examiner reports for every year. So the first thing they give you is the present value of tax shield for amortizable assets formula. The next is selected prescribed automobile amounts, individual federal income tax rates, selected indexed amounts for purpose of computing income taxes. So it's various amounts and credits that you could have for the year. For example, your basic amount, your age amount, or your medical expenses, or the RSP limit. The next would be prescribed interest rates. And then finally, it would be the maximum capital cost allowance rates for selected classes. Again, all of these are found in the Board of Examiner reports, and you don't need to memorize these. I'll have a link to all the Board of Examiner reports in the description below. Thanks again for watching my video, and I hope this helps you in studying for tax on the CFI and understanding the concepts. If you want to know how to study for other topics on the day 3 of the CFI, you should check out one of my other videos on this series. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up, and if you have any comments, please let me know below.